Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. I just wanted to uh, first start off with a little uh, announcement that we do have a little bit of technical difficulty with uh, the slides. Everything is a little bit delayed, but we're going to make sure that everything is working uh, one way or the other. But uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lindsay Pons, and I'm an application scientist here at Protochips. Today, we are hosting our second webinar in this series, Closing the Pressure Gap, focused on doing high pressure gaseous experiments looking at gas solid phase interactions within the transmission electron microscope. In this series, we are looking at how the atmospheric system can expand the field of heterogeneous catalysis by visualizing catalysts at the nanoscale. Because catalyst materials are typically most active in nanoparticle form, the TEM is an ideal characterization tool with its powerful resolving capabilities. However, as you might know, investigating supported nanoparticles before and after drying, calcination, reduction or reaction only gives us a snapshot of what is happening during these processes. So this is why over the years, technology evolved in an attempt to introduce gases into a vacuum chamber of the TEM safely in order to watch these materials undergo these mechanisms under more realistic environments with the hopes of getting direct insights in how these structures affect their function. The pressure of the experiments is a major variable that can affect those results. And this webinar series is meant to give you a glimpse of what is possible today to create a realistic environment within the TEM with our uh, atmospheric system combined with machine vision software. Just very quickly, if you're not uh, familiar with our company, Protochips chooses to focus on an entire workflow for in situ TEM and not just providing TEM related hardware. Everything from sample preparation to the accuracy and robustness of the in situ parameters of data collection and data management can affect your results and the ability for you to properly scale from bulk set down to nano, uh, the reproducibility of your experiment, obviously, but also the productivity during an experiment. So we just say that success lies in the entire scientific workflow and not just the hardware design itself. And if you're interested in, in looking at things like how to do sample preparation, we do have an entire webinar series on that as well. So we are very grateful to have you here. And before I introduce the star of today's webinar, a couple of housekeeping items to cover very quickly. In this webinar, everybody is muted due to the size of the audience, but also to prevent unintentional interruptions while our presenter is giving their talk. And if you have a question for her, please enter it in the questions box on your GoToWebinar panel, and we will address the questions at the end of the talk. There will be a short survey that pops up after the webinar, and we would greatly appreciate it if you fill that out to help us with future webinar series and to get to know our audience a little bit better. Uh, and for those who need it, a certificate of completion will come into your email after the webinar as well. Okay, so that is all the housekeeping items out of the way. So without further ado, uh, let me tell you a little bit about our speaker and then I'm gonna hand my microphone over to her and shut off my uh, webcam and my microphone until the end of the presentation. So uh, Dr. Kinga Unisik is a senior R&D staff scientist in the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. She received her PhD in Material Science and Engineering from the Ohio State University in 2008. Her current research focuses on developing and applying analytical and operando electron microscopy techniques using our systems to investigate environmental effects on materials properties and also the behavior with an emphasis on high temperature, oxidation, corrosion, and catalysis. So Dr. Kinga Unisik, thank you so much for joining us. I am gonna shut off my webcam and my microphone and uh, we'll continue from there. Good luck. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Carnes. Um, thank you for introduction. Can you hear me, actually? Yes, we hear you okay, really well. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> awesome, awesome. <laughs> Just making sure. Uh, <clears throat> so before I start, I would like to also thank uh, Jeff Jennifer McConnell and uh, Madeline uh, Dukes uh, for giving me this opportunity and inviting me to this webinar so I can share my research and um, present it in front of you. As uh, it was mentioned, I will be talking about introduction uh, of the water vapor into in situ gas uh, cell and trying to um, co correlate the reactions and uh, uh, look at the morphological changes that happens in the different type of material. So with that, let me start that in materials uh, research, there are a number of very important phenomena that we all want to study. For example, corrosion, uh, we want to investigate the degradation of the materials uh, in using, using studying the mechanical properties. We want to 
um, correlate the structure and um, uh, be behavior of the material. As well as in phase transformation, we want to study, for example, nucleation growth at certain um, temperatures and so on. And um, for this type of research, we use different type of characterization techniques. But one that is very familiar to me is uh, advanced scanning transmission electron microscopy, where we can utilize this uh, capability and we can image uh, materials, study the defects, as well as um, uh, investigate different uh, new processing techniques, uh, such as uh, where we can investigate the introduction of the dislocations, look at the materials at atomic scale level. Furthermore, using electron diffraction, we can uh, co study the structure and identify phases. And utilizing spectroscopy, we can use uh, EELS and EDS to look at the uh, materials um, distribution within certain area, as well as uh, identify um, and understand electronic structure. So, uh, with the, to extend these capabilities uh, of using advanced electron microscopy, we can combine it with advanced, um, specify um, very specific um, holders for the in-situ capability that will uh, broaden up different opportunities. And here is an example of different type of uh, holders that can be uh, used, for example, to study the deformation, uh, uh, liquid uh, cell, uh, studying corrosion. Uh, we can use the heating holder to investigate the phase transformation, biasing holder to capture the uh, ionic transport. And uh, finally, to study the environmental effects, uh, we can use the gas holder. And this is the um, holder that I will be using in this, in this talk in the next studies. So what is the motivation behind this? It wasn't like one day I woke up and I said, I want to do in-situ microscopy. Um, I had experience in um, using conventional methodology, method, med methods to study oxidation behavior of the materials as well as degradation of uh, the catalyst. But in both uh, fields, basically, what we have, we have um, that we study the uh, material in before and after reaction, right? Um, we can use different techniques to really understand what's happening uh, within um, the testing conditions. So if we look at the study catalyst, we can see that we will basically sensitize the catalyst and then look at the spent catalyst. And we really don't know what's happening under certain environment, pressure and temperature. How do we get from a point A to point B? What was the way? And why is this important? It is important because the reactions are dynamic, right? They initiate at the interface, at atomic and nanoscale level, and they can uh, in influence the subsequent uh, reaction process, uh, oxidation process, and so on. If we can combine this type of information, we can improve the existing computational models, we can improve selectivity, and hopefully in the future, this can reduce the cost and the experiment time. So what are the ways that we can actually utilize the in-situ capabilities? There are two ways uh, to do in-situ microscopy. Um, the first one is environmental TEM, and here's an example of the microscope from ASU, uh, where we can uh, study um, uh, materials using dedicated instrument, using differential pumping. Um, but the pressures that we can investigate, the uh, reactions are few tor. However, if we use closer reactions, we can go to all the way to atmospheric pressure to 760 torr. In addition to that, we can use any instrument um, that, we can, that we have in our um, facility. So just um, obtaining the dedicated holder with the um, gas delivery system, we can uh, utilize the system that, that exists in our facility. And at the same time, we can uh, allow other users to uh, use that instrument. So there is more flexibility. Um, there are no, um, th there are benefits uh, from both uh, techniques. However, since at ORNL we have closed cell uh, system, I will be focusing on this system. So let's dive in and take a look a little bit deeper into the, um, the system. 
So gas delivery uh, system uh, called Prototype Atmosphere is a computer control uh, system that delivers the gas into the holder. And here is the tip of the holder where you can see the O-ring uh, MEMS uh, pair device where we call this um, uh, bottom window or we can uh, use spacer and the heater. Uh, heater is where we deposit our sample. It can be called also e chip and they are both uh, secured by putting the clamp. The reaction can go all the way from room temperature to 1000 degrees C at various pressures. So it, we can also operate um, um, the system at low pressures as well as go to high temperature and we can use different gases. So with that, okay. So with that, let me um, show them a quick movie that the prototype design we deposit our sample on silicon nitride electron transparent window on the e-chip. Then we flip the chip and put um, the uh, MEM devices together as a sandwich. And then we place them on the tip of the, our uh, holder. Then subsequently we will put clam uh, clamp over and secure it with the screws. So now the sample um, and the system is ready uh, to be inserted into microscope. Uh, there are reliable contacts that uh, they allow for the different uh, measurements. And then as you can see, that depending what system you have, you insert the holder into the system and then co connect the capillaries or feeding lines into the holder. Now you can everything control by the computer and using the external tanks, you can deliver different gases depending on your experiment to the uh, two tanks they are uh, placed in the uh, manifold. And then the gas will be returned into the vacuum tank that was highlighted on the bottom. So after, afterwards, when the gas flows into the holder and out, now let's take a look what happened uh, in the, at the tip. So then you can see that there's a flow of the gas between bottom and the top chip. And then the bow cut within the holder, this is the newest generation, allow, allows for the EDS analysis um, and data acquisition. And as I mentioned, we can flow different gases. We can go to temperature all the way up to 1000 degrees C, and we can capture those events um, that are dynamic at spatial uh, resolution. So just a quick recap, when we take a look at the, um, the E-chip, uh, you can see that there is a membrane of the silicon carbide and I want to mention that the most important thing is that you want to have your sample uh, within electron transparent uh, window. Um, this is a little bit uh, older chip, usually uh, now these days we have two by three. Um, and then when you take a look at the, at the cross section of the uh, gas cell, you can see that the gap between uh, uh, each chip and then the bottom window is approximately five micron. So you do not want to have any chunky material there because it will basically um, destroy the silicon nitride window. And then um, the reason why we uh, there are the electron transparent uh, regions covered with silicon nitride is so that that's where we can capture um, the reaction. Uh, otherwise, if we place the sample in silicon carbide, uh, then uh, we won't be able to see anything. And then again, based on the on the different um, um, generations of the holder. The latest one has the bow cut that allows on the uh, generating, uh, capturing the um, uh, X-rays in the uh, uh, better manner than it's been before. So the system that we operate at OR now, uh, we uh, actually have two aberration corrected uh, instruments that are capable to run the in-situ uh, in -situ gas reactions. One is JAW 2200. Uh, the pictures you have it here, this one is uh, equipped with the EDS system. It's not um, the newest one, but it has the capability. And we can also run the in-situ experiments on Titan. Uh, and that instrument is equipped with uh, Gatan quantum electron energy low spectro uh, spectrometer. Um, here in this uh, image, you can see the lines that go in and out the holder. And just to better visualize it, so from the manifold, we have the boom that will come and it will introduce the gas uh, following the uh, blue arrows. 
in this case, we just uh, Larry Allard, Dr. Larry Allard, designed clamshare to help uh, reduce the pressure and pulling on the uh, on the holder uh, by the uh, lines. Uh, and then when we return uh, from the holder, we will um, instead of going right away to the manifold, uh, based on our internal funding, we try to develop and add residual gas analyzer that uh, uses EVR uh, uh, valve as well as um, uh, turbo uh, pump uh, that allows us to uh, that uh, allows us to capture and uh, the gas on the exit side uh, side uh, using residual gas analyzer from a Stanford Research System. And uh, with that, we can flow the gas coming out uh, either um, just to the manifold or if we open the EVR uh, valve, the gas can flow directly there uh, and to the manifold or if the, our, we call it hand valve, is closed, we can uh, direct entire gas from the gas cell into the uh, RGA chamber. So before we move on, the sample preparation is very crucial. If you don't have a good sample or if you don't have, you think you deposit your sample and actually it's not on the right position, it's very important. Here's an example of different methodology, how we can deposit the sample. Uh, first one uh, highlighted as uh, uh, A, uh, hold on, because I have multiple screens and my laser pointer does not work, okay. Uh, so, um, this is just a simple drop cast of the catalyst. Now, if your catalyst uh, is in the nano size uh, level, you don't have any problem. It definitely goes uh, to the electron transparent regions. Uh, our catalyst is engineer catalyst. Usually the size is 300 microns. We need to crash it. So that's why we're ending up with this chunky uh, pieces. And then very often it is very difficult to um, for small pieces to end up on the electron transparent windows. Another way to deposit the catalyst will be just to uh, sprinkle it uh, on the e-chip by masking it. So in this case, in BA, we use, for example, just regular um, e-chip that was with the broken membrane or, for example, liquid uh, e-chip that is uh, more precise and more, has more narrow gap. Additionally, for structural materials, we cannot, of course, uh, um, deposit them um, by a drop cast, we can uh, either fit the regular lamella. If we worried about gallium implantation, we can, for example, uh, use the electropolish atom probe needles and then just use FIP for uh, touching it. Or we can use the electropolish three millimeter discs and then uh, also cut it out with the FIP. Um, preferable with, for example, plasma fib these days, and then attach them to the um, e-chips. And then finally, you can also deposit uh, thin films uh, that way you can investigate uh, material either in continuous manner or just by mask, uh, masking it. And this can be find uh, more information on it in this publication. So then, for our first, really, really first reaction that I've done was uh, we studied the uh, nickel aluminite. And here is an example. I was searching for nanopowder and I end up with really not, uh, with, uh, basically very chunky, large particles. We crushed them and after uh, some uh, many tries, we, uh, we end up on very small powder uh, particles uh, at the sil uh, silicon nitride window. Uh, what we perform is, uh, First, we look at the EDS analysis before we tested the material, and um, then we expose the, uh, the material to flowing oxygen at 300 torr, for example. And the movie, basically, that I will show you is um, uh, heating from 500 degrees to 800 degrees, and um, the movie is sped up. And I hope you, you don't have any delays and you can see the movie. What you can see here is that the uh, oxidation does not perform in the uniform manner, that the oxide does not grow uniformly into the, um, the core of the particle. And then what we learn also that basically the oxide that is formed uh, as expected is alumina and then uh, the core uh, is becoming um, uh, enriched in nickel. 
further work can be done, we can extract time elapsed uh, series from the movie where we can uh, start measuring the uh, reaction progression and extract the uh, oxidation rate from the, uh, from the uh, reaction. Then the, the idea would be, can we compare on the data with ex situ data? And then uh, what is the relationship of the in situ and ex situ um, experiments? Um, is it reliable? That's always the question that we receive. Um, so as you can see, we can, uh, we can uh, um, place our data on this uh, well-published pub uh, plot by Grabke, for example, for alumina. Uh, oxidation uh, plot. But furthermore, what we can do with this is to um, really look into the oxide scale. We can look at the grain size morphology. We can identify the size of the, uh, the grains. In this case, we got uh, 20 nanometers grains. Grains that are also having some de defects um, that can affect the transport of the species. And then we can really identify what, what type of uh, phase we have, in this case we'll, we'll have delta phase, um, that based on the ex situ experiments form at uh, around 800 degrees C and this is correlating very well with our experiment that we uh, tested at, at 800 degrees C. I want to mention that the EDS that I show uh, was, um, those were our first reactions and those were on the um, atmosphere holders that did not have a bow cut, so we actually had to remove the uh, sample and generate EDS, EDS data um, on the different holder. No big deal because it was oxidizing conditions. That would be a challenge if we have reducing conditions, right? You don't want to open the gas cell, expose it to air because that does not make really sense. Um, but I just want to mention, I have uh, later on all the data is from uh, regular uh, in situ conditions with the bow tie holder. Anyway, uh, furthermore, if we take a more uh, deeper look, we can also see that within the oxide scale, we have uh, nano size and nickel particles. And then moving on, we can look at the, 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 the progression of the reaction uh, at higher pressures and then identify the uh, uh, faceted cubic crystal of nickel at the initial state of the oxidation as well as uh, formation just metallic particles uh, with, uh, within those uh, cubic structures. So those are very detailed uh, characterizations that we can do. Furthermore, um, you know, that the, ma the shape matters, right? The, the particle is not spherical and so on. So depositing the nickel uh, alumina fil uh, film uh, that is more spherical uh, shows us the progression of the reaction, for example, in these conditions at uh, 700 uh, degrees C, the movie is sped up under flowing oxygen. And what we learn is that uh, the, again, the reaction does not uh, progress. There is no uh, any sharp edge that will initiate the um, reaction. The reaction basically starts most likely at, at certain defects um, that uh, initiate the reaction and the reaction progress in that uh, region. And then, so in this case, the EDS is generated in the um, within the, the reaction at certain conditions. And again, what we can study and we can visualize it, that we have um, uh, formation of the alumina scale and then um, the depletion of nickel. We can look at the interfaces and then also a formation of metallic particles. So now uh, we can also apply this in-situ capability to multi-state in-situ reaction. So um, now moving more, more towards the catalyst, um, the benefit of residual gas analyzer is incredible. Um, for example, we could just um, study the reaction without residual gas analyzer, we will end up with these four pictures. Each picture represents the conditions that is outlined here. For example, reaction in hydrogen at 760 torr, um, after one hour exposure at 400 degrees C, and then um, step number three, is a mixture of oxygen with nitrogen, also after one hour and so on. But really, um, 
you can tell somebody that were the conditions, but you really don't have proof. So generating the uh, partial pressure uh, versus time uh, plots and showing that we have those conditions and we can correlate them, uh, we can clearly see this. From these uh, reactions, we can also um, start measuring the uh, particle uh, size uh, of the, this, this is for platinum, for example. And we can see that uh, uh, that uh, the more drastic changes happens at higher temperatures. For example, at uh, for reducing conditions, uh, when we look uh, at the initial state reaching 500 degrees C, at one uh, or after one hour, we can see that in these conditions, we uh, we have uh, larger particles than in the oxidizing conditions. So with that. Um, uh, we don't see big difference between heating and reaching 400 degrees C. So um, I just want to show example how to um, uh, capture the difference and so on. So the next experiment that we did was, for example, heating um, material, uh, platinum, titanium, on titanium support in vacuum. And here, here are the examples. Um, so here's the snapshot after reaching 400 degrees C. And if we outline the uh, the particles and use these particles as a center point for aligning for the um, correlation between the images, uh, we can see that after um, exposing for 60 minutes uh, in hydrogen, uh, we can see that there are variation in the uh, in the part particles, and we have some uh, centering of the platinum particles. So let's see at this at the movie. Uh, if you can. This is very fast. I, this movie is sped up, but uh, um, let's try it again. You can see the centering of the particles, but uh, I think the the based on the size, um, the interaction is different. So when we recall the, for example, the conditions from uh, after one hour at um, exposure in reducing conditions, and we correlated uh, for with another conditions. Um, with uh, exposure to the uh, oxidizing conditions, we can clearly see that in this case, uh, after applying the uh, oxidizing conditions, we can see that there is the uh, particle redistribution in dissociation. Um, also, what we can do by selective representative images, for example, uh, for reducing oxidizing conditions, we can see that uh, we can identify the location and we can capture the structure for each location. So in this case, we say we have uh, titania and then number two represents the uh, platinum particle. And then what we can see, we can see slight um, uh, changes into uh, within the particle as well. Uh, by measuring the despacing, we can see that uh, uh, there is small lattice uh, increase in the despacing for the oxidizing co conditions. This could be very important uh, detail that can uh, be into, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, correlate and introduce to the modeling uh, uh, and simulations to inform the, uh, them about the behavior of the material at these conditions. And then finally, um, what I want to mention is uh, we don't have to do only EDS uh, uh, analysis. Uh, we can apply also EELS uh, capability. So here is uh, we just start an example of, for of um, cobalt oxide that was modified with the man manganese on silica uh, uh, support. And as you can see here, uh, that's for the CO CO2 reduction. Um, with the outline of different steps of the reaction. But uh, what we can see here is that uh, after certain conditions, under after 122 minutes at 410 uh, degrees C, at very high pressures, we can uh, have um, dissociation and uh, formation of metallic cobalt that was uh, generated by um, um, eels, uh, um, and then um, the, the eels, I want to say that the eels was generated at those conditions. So we did not have to cool it down. Um, the, therefore, uh, the 
capability that we're having uh, with this uh, prototype system is amazing because we can uh, either do um, EDS, EELS, uh, we can reveal the structure of the, uh, of the particles. So with that, let's move on to the water vapor. Uh, we know that at many high temperature uh, reactions, the water vapor is uh, present. Uh, it might have deleterious effect. For example, this is just an example of the uh, bond coating that was exposed to the dry air. And then the air with different percentages of water vapor. The, the takeaway message is the reaction accelerates when we introduce water vapor, particularly 10% of water vapor. There is something about that. And then we can see that uh, there is an effect of water vapor also in the catalytic uh, system as well. So with that, uh, we initiated our study with uh, designing this water vapor fixture, as is shown here, uh, where we introduced the uh, water here. We opened the valve for the vapor and introduced it into the cell. However, later on, Protochips designed its own uh, vapor delivery system. And here is an example where we can uh, clearly uh, attach it to the manifold and which will allow us those uh, reaction in the with the water vapor and this uh, system is much much better it allows for purging of the uh, water vapor as well um, so definitely it's uh, more desirable so why the water vapor is challenging well the water vapor is challenging because water condensates and then when we have the supply and return lines they cannot be heated uh, we do not want to heat them because first of all, uh, we will have a drift in our samples, right? Um, therefore, to really investigate um, uh, the reactions, the delivery of this water vapor can be uh, at room temperature. So the room temperature uh, will be to de determining how much water vapor we can get in our system. So if we have in the at 20 degrees C, let's say, um, approximately 2% um, of water vapor, that brings us to approximately 17 torr. 17 torr, 2% out of entire 760 torr. So when we look at this phase diagram for the water, we can see that there are different states of water, um, solid, uh, uh, liquid, as well as gas. So if we stay at the pressures uh, lower than uh, 17 torr, we will be in the um, evaporating uh, in, in the vapor con uh, conditions. So then increasing temperature, this will allow us to have higher uh, water vapor pressure uh, in the system. However, as I said, we cannot heat the lines. So one way, uh, another way to do that is it, what if we lower this total pressure of the reaction this will for example will, it should increase the uh, water uh, water vapor pressure so if we drop the total pressure to 760 torr uh, 170 uh, torr this will uh, end up with approximately 10 percent of water content so now let's start introducing the uh, water vapor um, based on the all these experiments i uh, I suggest to really, before you start doing any experiments, to set the baseline for the measurements that you have. If you forget or, you know, you don't know how your system uh, behaves and so on. So it's very, very important to actually record what are the conditions uh, before you start uh, reactions, particularly with water vapor, right? The water vapor is everywhere. If you don't use your system for a while, it's going to be there. If you don't bake out, this is actually... Uh, um, the um, partial pressure plot uh, generated by RGA versus time. And as you can see, uh, the data first are uh, in the purple for just RGA chamber. So we did not open any valves, we just measured the RGA chamber. We, then we, we open the uh, EVR valve. Uh, so then we measure all the conditions from the tip of the uh, holder all the way to RGA. And then EVR opening H1 valve, for example, we measure all the way on the, uh, the conditions uh, from, from that point. And finally, opening the, uh, re one of the receiving tanks uh, 
uh, one of the uh, uh, tanks, um, supply tanks, uh, we can measure conditions that are in the manifold. So knowing that gas, because you don't want to suddenly say, oh, I have a water vapor, but actually that was already there and so on. You want to minimize that. That is why uh, we do have the uh, heating tapes on our RGA system to perform those bakes uh, and um, and uh, prepare the system for the uh, for the reactions, particularly for the uh, for the water vapor reactions. Here is um, a graphical user interface, just for those who are not familiar, uh, showing that we, for example, one of the supply tanks um, uh, has. Um, 100% of water vapor, and you can hear, see it very well here, it's 16.2 torr, and then the, the valve is open, it goes through the, uh, goes through the holder all the way to the uh, vacuum tank, but on the way to the vacuum tank, uh, we have RGA system where we can monitor and confirm and that water vapor um, is present in that, uh, in that carrier gas. Um, so that is very important. I think I forgot to mention that the RG, uh, residual gas analyzer is on the exit side, and the reason why, because that way we know that the reaction, that the sample reach and experience the conditions that we are measuring. So then, uh, just an uh, example of the uh, mass plot where uh, we can see that uh, the blue um, plot shows us no water vapor so setting the, those conditions and measuring it and then just introducing the water vapor we can see that uh, the peak for water uh, clearly increases uh, we over uh, we put a lot of water vapor in these conditions so anyways uh, moving on to the experiments with water vapor uh, here is an example for example for uh, magnesium oxide crystals uh, as you can see before, exposure, they are uh, nice facets with sharp corners, clean surfaces, crystals. Um, and then after exposing the crystals to the water vapor, uh, we form magnesium hydroxide at the surfaces and then the morphological changes are clearly visible. So before we have our GA system, our idea was actually to use them as uh, markers if the water vapor is present there or not. Um, it would not be very detailed uh, quantification and, and so on, but at least it would be some kind of indicator that we deliver the water vapor. But uh, I, I'm so glad we were able to um, uh, design and uh, build the RGA system and attach it to the uh, our uh, uh, manifold uh, because now we have more precise experiments with the residual gas analyzer. And then, furthermore, experiments with 100% of water vapor um, at uh, um, 300 degrees C. The 300 degrees C is the temperature the sample experience. The delivery still is uh, room temperature, and the pressure is 17 torr. So what we can see here is we can see um, almost close at atomic scale level um, the uh, re uh, shaping of the uh, platinum particle uh, on titania and this is within the first few minutes of the exposure to the water vapor right and then uh, generating um, uh, Fourier transfer we can see that there is um, um, rearrangement uh, and changes uh, within one 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 uh, plane uh, and further, we can apply this type of uh, capabilities and combining it with other uh, studies. So this is uh, another study that uh, it was under one of our programs where we uh, try to determine the impact of water vapor on the activity of magnesium oxide catalyst for uh, aldo condensation reactions. And here is an, uh, the material in uh, under flowing nitrogen th uh, 30 minutes and after exposure to um, after exposure to the water vapor at 100, 150 degrees C. And combining this type of capability with other characterization techniques, we were able to determine that magnesium oxide 111 uh, derived hydroxide is responsible for act activity following water exposure. And um, 
we inform the thermal regeneration to uh, recover 94% of the activity. So, so uh, really looking at the different uh, planes that were uh, exposed to the water vapor, we were able to uh, confirm and correlate um, um, this type of uh, reactions um, and um, on this magnesium oxide study. So then uh, mixing the water vapor with another gas. Um, so before I show you 100% water vapor with 17% uh, percent, uh, 17 torr, now moving on to higher uh, total pressure. So in this case, just on this uh, GUI interface, we can see that we can mix water vapor with argon, for example. So uh, this plot shows that the red plot shows no water vapor. Uh, green plot shows just 5% water vapor and argon, and then correlation this with 100% of water vapor when we have this uh, big peak. So definitely the water vapor will decrease if we have the main carry gas, uh, right, um, that is in the uh, higher percentage. And here, going back to nickel aluminide studies, again, not perfect particles. We can see right now it was heating going from 600 to 750 degrees C. Um, exposure and then holding at 750 degrees C. In this case, we have 8% of water vapor and 92% of oxygen. And then what we, what we can study is again that the oxidation does not progress in the uniform man, uh, manner. Um, this tells us that it's very difficult if you would like to study the um, uh, formation of the reaction at certain interfaces, this gives us idea that we will have to be very lucky to select the right location, for example, to study those uh, reactions in that location. But then at the same time, we confirming the conditions with the residual gas analyzer uh, by confirming the conditions that are present uh, within the cell. Then um, taking the... Um, screenshots and uh, showing the time elapsed series uh, for different events, uh, we can see that uh, uh, the uh, oxidation progress in non-uniform uh, manner, um, the oxides are faceted, and then uh, the challenge will be the shape and the thickness, um, and then uh, non-uniform uh, oxidation uh, challenges, high resolution stem imaging, because if you zoom in, you can basically miss all the action that's happening somewhere else. And then, uh, as you saw at the movie at the beginning, heating from 650 to 700, we uh, changing the pressure all time, temperature, uh, basically, uh, we getting out of focus. So that's another challenge, right, to changing those conditions and trying to be uh, capturing uh, imaging at, at uh, atomic level. And then uh, one of the last thing that I want to share is that we not only um, uh, mix the water vapor with carrier gas, but we also can um, mix the, with any other uh, uh, vapors. So uh, in this case, we use uh, ethanol vapor. So this study was on uh, perform on uh, silver with zirconia and uh, silica support. Here's an uh, example of the silver particle. Uh, but based on the number of different uh, characterization techniques, uh, it was obtained that um, hydrogen uh, will uh, reduce the silver and uh, shifts the products to the butines and improve, uh, improve the catalyst life, lifetime. And that was initiated by this apparendo, apparendo XPS, uh, where we can see that ethanol plus, plus hydrogen gives us this reducing condition. So now, uh, do we see this? Is this real? Can we mimic that in our uh, uh, in-situ gas reaction? holder as well as so that way we can put, put the morphology with the real data and so on. Um, so that was the goal. Uh, before reaching the reaction with ethanol and hydrogen, there were a few steps that we have to follow to really mimic that, uh, that conditions, exposure that are listed here. I don't want to take too much time because we're almost close to, to the end. Uh, but uh, the, the most important thing is that when we look, look at the red spectrum, it clearly captures the presence of ethanol and ad, other hydrocarbons. Um, so uh, then clearly we can see, we can say that looking at this image in the red frame, 
that those that the catalyst really experienced those conditions, right? So there is a difference um, between uh, in the in the conditions. But morphological changes, for example, going from hydrogen, nitrogen, and um, ethanol to hydrogen are minimal based on the measurements of the particle uh, size. So anyways, I think this was the, one of the uh, most exciting uh, results where we can uh, actually uh, measure, uh, capture that ethanol uh, vapor with the uh, RGA system. So in summary, I want to say that um, uh, in-situ CCGR stem allows on the experiments at high pressures and high temperatures under different media. We show that we are able to control and introduce water vapor into the gas cell. Uh, we can mix the water vapor and other uh, vapors like ethanol with other carrier gases and we can uh, utilize prototype uh, clarity software as well RGA system to monitor that. And then we can do both EDS and EELS at conditions, at, at certain temperature and pressure to capture those uh, reactions um, and phenomena. And then our uh, RGA system is crucial, really. Um, it's something that it needs to be there. Otherwise, you will be just pointing and saying, yeah, those are the conditions that we have. With that, I want to thank a number of uh, um, colleagues that were involved and helped me throughout this uh, few years and contribute to uh, this type of research. And particularly, I want to um, thank La uh, Dr. Larry Allard for introducing me to the in situ world and uh, teaching me um, the first in situ reaction. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Kinga. That was uh, awesome. That was a really, really great presentation. And uh, we had no delay, so it was, uh, it was really, really uh, nice. Um, so the floor is open for some questions. I've already seen some questions coming in. And I'm just going to start from uh, one of the questions that came in, Kinga, uh, so you can answer them. So uh, one question that came in was asking that inside one of the, or uh, on one of the slides, you showed an eels spectrum of cobalt nanoparticles. And uh, you talked about the cobalt being in a metallic state. So the question was, uh, how did you know that the cobalt was pure metallic cobalt? Was there some anti-correlation of oxygen and cobalt maps? Or was there some uh, quantitative uh, eels chemical analysis? Or how did you get to the conclusion that the cobalt was metallic? Well, first of all, the, uh, we had many other experiments with the Institute situ XRD, uh, um, also XPS, um, that uh, we knew at what conditions, uh, that at certain conditions uh, when we have uh, cobalt oxide uh, on silica, it will start, and under flowing hydrogen, it will start forming, um, it will start for, uh, forming metallic species. Right, so we try to mimic those reactions. Um, this is just uh, pulling out the study from uh, from the uh, variety of different conditions. But the the goal was to really um, see if uh, we can delay the formation of this uh, cobalt metallic species. Right. Um, so before it was a mixture um, of the uh, uh, man manganese and cobalt, and then um, um, after applying eels and having this uh, reducing conditions and looking at the peaks um, as well as the maps uh, that uh, within the uh, within the um, locations where the particle uh, the area were analyzed, we uh, we mainly see cobalt. So um, there was no like in detail. Uh, Analysis is just a general standard yields characterization based on the background subtractions and analysis and having both uh, reducing condition as a hydrogen and also um, just not seeing any other um, correlation with manganese and oxygen, we were able to um, confirm that it was metallic yeah. and correlation with other techniques. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Uh, maybe a question on top of that is, um, did you uh, check in advance with the RGA, maybe if you had any oxygen left in the system when you started adding hydrogen? So did you 
uh, check if there was any residual oxygen in the system from you know opening everything in the beginning or how how did she do that so um, so like I, like I said at the beginning I always check it doesn't matter if this is the reaction with water vapor or not first we bake the system over the night then we purge it with uh, I, depending on which system we're using one, uh, one system uses argon as a purging gas the other uh, system uses nitrogen um, so basically we purge the system after we load the cell um, three times um, and more details can be found in the publications to what pressures we go um, and then basically um, after this, the manifold and the lines and the holder is purged um, then we will in introduce to the, the reducing conditions in this case for example hydrogen when we run the reactions and when the oxidizing conditions that's no big deal right uh, but uh, with the reducing uh, the purging is very important, the baking is very important, and there is always the baseline somewhere that you're getting um, some, we always will, will detect some type of, uh, I would say, internal water vapor type of, that is within the lines, right, but that's, yeah. that's, that's just basically that's why you want to measure it before the reaction, what we're having without introducing nitrogen, what we have after introducing like purging, purging, that's, and that's setting the baseline, that's what we're measuring. Yeah. One thing that you have to remember is also uh, the uh, RGA at the exit side, and then also it really depends on the uh, how much we will flow uh, and open the valve uh, for the gas to come in, right? Sometimes, uh, uh, basically, we have just just to confirmation that we have flowing gas and so on. But sometimes, if you really want to confirm uh, that you have flowing hydrogen, you actually want to open the EVR valve as much as you can to really see that um, um, you know uh, you having those conditions. But this is just a teeny tiny percentage what the cell is getting, right? Because we cannot go to the higher pressures. No, exactly. It might be good to know very quickly from our side that the newest update for uh, atmosphere software does allow you to go to high pressures and also measure the RGA at the same same time. So that that's really cool. Uh, we've got some really awesome results coming out that we're hopefully presenting on the, on the conference. Uh, but besides that, um, so another question was for the manganese oxide uh, experiments. Did you also look at any beam effects and how did you avoid the beam effect that you looked at in the microscope? Right. Uh, so definitely, uh, we use the very low beam current. If um, if the reaction is very long, for example, many reactions for the catalyst that I've been working on is always exposure one hour or thirty minutes at certain conditions and so on. That's why I don't have a lot of movie on, movies on this because what I do, I will, I, I always want to have certain baselines. So I will record it if I, you know, at the initial state and then basically after one hour so trying to minimize the exposure to the beam um, and then also analyzing the catalyst before we introduce it into the cell right so uh, you know uh, if there are any changes if there is the uh, beam uh, interaction uh, the ma uh, material interact uh, and changes under the beam so then you have to lower the beam current and so on so this is the B, uh, the important part to screen the catalyst before uh, do your homework <clears throat> before you determine those conditions uh, that you interfere. You don't want to interfere definitely with electron beam uh, on your reactions and so on. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I mean, beam reactions are always something that can happen, and as you say, it's great to have um, an idea at least of how your sample reacts with beam before you even do your experiments. So, right. yeah, I completely understand. Um, another question that came in was, uh, so you are using quite a high concentration in vapor, such as ethanol or, or water in a carrier gas of hydrogen. Um, and the question is, uh, do you heat your gases before delivering them to the system or are they coming in cold? Uh, and the question is for both ethanol and water vapor. No, that's what I mentioned in my talk. Uh, we do not, we cannot, right? Because if we start heating the lines, then we will have the drift in our holder. Um, our RGA uh, system also, um, and then gas delivery system is far away from the holder, uh, so we cannot heat them. They go based on the 
room temperature. So the room temperature is the uh, lowest temperature on the uh, is that uh, during the path of the gas that travels. That's why um, the way how we manage the higher water vapor pressure and how higher uh, ethanol pressure is by lowering total pressure. So we, as I explained before, is um, if we lower the total pressure of the system, uh, we can have um, so basically, if if we, very simple, uh, at atmospheric pressure with 760 torr, we have 2% of water vapor, which is 17 torr. If we keep the 17 torr, but we lower the total pressure to 170 for a better math, easier math, then we can see that now we will end up with the 10% of water vapor in the system based based on this analysis. And then I want to follow up on the other uh, previous question with the, you know, that's why it, uh, with the beam, uh, inter, inter, beam effects and so on. Uh, that's why, you know, EDS is great, but our EDS system is not very great uh, on the system that we have. The new new instruments, of course, they have better ED, four detectors, two detectors and so on, but much better capabilities. But that's why we kind of also don't want to expose materials too much to generating EDS maps because that can also interfere. So if we do EDS yeah. very often, it will be on the different region or at the end of the reaction that we know we don't care anymore and so on. So there's lots of different things that you can do or you just rerun the reaction, right? So yeah yeah it's always it's always a little bit of a trade-off between you know do I get a lot of chemical data or do I get yeah. a very stable sample in the microscope? Right. Um, there is uh, one more question, and the question is, uh, could you get an uh, energy loss near edge structure uh, spectrum, even though you're looking through those relatively thick silicon nitride windows uh, in, the, in the microscope? Um, that is a tricky question. Uh, I, you know, you have to think that you're going through this five micron uh, gap, um, and then uh, you're going through 30 nanometers, uh, 30 nanometers of silicon nitride window, and then another 50 nanometer, approximately 50 nanometer. I um, I really don't know. I think it's challenging. We try to do something similar just to try to measure the gas compositions, but um, I think it's uh, it's it's challenging. It's definitely not. It would be challenging on the sample because then the sample additionally bring extra extra. Um, thickness to the measurements. Yeah, I think I think you're completely right. Um, so EELS is definitely possible, uh, EDS is definitely possible, and everything above that is going to be a little bit more tricky, or is also going to induce a lot of beam damage. So, uh, yeah, I, I think if you have very thin sample, two layer structure, then yeah, I think yeah. <laughs> perfect yeah, sample. Exactly. That's the most important, right? <laughs> you saw my chunky samples. Uh, definitely uh, not on those. <laughs> No, I understand. <laughs> yeah. Um, regarding time, I'm going to ask you one final question, and then if there's any other questions, then um, I'm going to email them through to you and see uh, if you can answer them via the email. So uh, the final question is basically more on the preparation methods a little bit, because you mentioned that you can also add thin films to e-chips. Um, so somebody's wondering, uh, uh, how do you usually do that? Because you know you can grow them or you can you know redeposit them um while growing them somewhere else but it, it seems like a very tricky thing to get them exactly on that window where you would like them to be uh, so do you have any tips on that uh, yes um, we actually try to develop this uh, methodology and it is actually um, it is, that that method was is highlighted in the paper that i showed um let me see i had a backup slide but i don't really see uh, one second, quick. I know we're in a rush. Oh, okay. Okay. Here it is. Can you see the slide? Yes, yes, we can. So, <clears throat> one way, so, so basically, you can mask it, right? So, like I said, you can mask it, you can um, use the, you can be very creative. Um, that we basically, uh, use, so this is our e chip. And this is our mask that we were doing. So we ha we use a liquid old liquid cell e chip that was broken, mm -hmm. and then we use this uh, silicon nitride microporous TM window. We glue it to it. That you have to be very take your time, right? 
but what you're gonna end up this is the outline of the, your liquid holder and uh, um, this is the window that was broken uh, you can see this uh, dark triangle uh, rectangular behind and those are here are the little holes that are etched and we use this as a mask so then when we put that together we put it this uh, mask on the on this uh, the, on this e chip for example we put it together we we uh, machine a uh, uh, e chip fixture that we put it uh, together and then clamp it hold it and then we put it into the spatter cham chamber and oh, that's right. how we spatter it and that's where you saw those islands the the one of the reaction uh, in so i think oxygen or air or um, basically that's what it was because one scientist in the high temperature oxidation field said when he looked at the data it's like well it would be perfect if the particles are spherical or uh, circular and so on and mine were like crushed right so basically that's why we try to design more circular fixtures um, but basically you don't have to maybe if you want to just tin film you don't even have to use this uh, microporous tm window you can just for example use liquid cell e chip and then you will end up with the rectangular uh, um, shape tin film and and of course you have to align this mask with this chip here they are flipped and to put together that um, uh, that rectangular window ends up on those uh, two by three electron transparent windows so there's a little bit trick uh, in the paper uh, at the beginning of the uh, Jovi paper from 2021 I think uh, we explain it in a little bit better detail but mm -hmm. uh, you can be very creative you can use anything I think but masking would be the way to do it yeah yeah, and that's uh, that's that's absolutely awesome. Um, now nowadays we also have a shadow mask for these kind of things where you oh, have masking tips, so you don't yeah you don't have to use uh, your own homemade built system, but um, it does work like this perfectly as well. So uh, it's a really nice way to get a nice layer exactly where you wanted them right on the on the, on the windows. Okay, well. Thank you so much for, for doing this webinar, uh, uh, Kinga. It was absolutely awesome. And uh, everybody you. for joining. Um, and uh, well, we are hoping to see you at the next webinar, uh, which is uh, very shortly as well. If you still want to register for that, you can go to our web, uh, website and register via that. I hope you guys are okay to stick around for the survey that pops up. Um, at, in the meantime, I, Kinga, thank you so much again and uh, everybody for, for listening. So I'm going to shut down the webinar and yeah. uh, wish you all a very lovely day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a good one.